All right, Space Rangers. Space Welcome Rangers? Back. What? When have you ever called anybody a Space Ranger? Don't you want to call them Space Rangers? I don't... Wouldn't you want that's to That's a weird a space thing ranger? to call somebody a space right. ranger. You, you do it. Then. I don't have a I don't have a clever nickname for it. What do we what are our fans called, Mike? Useloids? Useless. We'll just call they're useless fans. They're useless fans. <laughs> Let me try again about that. Do you want to start over from yeah, the very beginning? Start over okay. From the very beginning. I thought that was good. You, oh, you want to start? I over liked that? that. Okay, so we'll just All right. Yeah, so I didn't actually think space rangers was bad. I just okay. thought it was funny. All right, everyone, and welcome to the Useless Podcast. My name is Mike Stout. And I am Tony Garcia. And uh, you should probably take notice of the fact that we called the podcast by something slightly different than developer commentary. Well, because even though this is still a form of developer commentary, this isn't our developer commentary series. We're moving on to a new series. Uh, a new series? A new series of YouTube videos wait but they're not gonna be videos they're, they're not gonna be videos gonna be audio they're just gonna be audio and a Podcasts. lot of podcasts that's right a lot of you are gonna hate it but but you fucking asked for it you did ask for it i i read the youtube videos everybody's like where's tony yeah tony's the best part of the duo tony mm-hmm. they, 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 they were saying it yeah and tony is the part that makes this excellent the show is not even close to what it used to be without... To- I, mean, I mean, these are about what they were saying, Fuck right? you, Mike. We hate you. Yeah. yeah I'm pretty exactly. sure that's what was said. No, I, I seem to remember some people saying that exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to make them regret asking what happened to me. They're like, Tony's back, but we don't get any video. <laughs> Why don't we just show our stupid, ugly faces? Because, no. Because they're not, stupid and ugly? Yeah, and that's okay. not worth... Nobody wants to see us sitting around staring at a camera giving our stupid opinion. Plus, it would take a bunch of work to you know set up like a set... Oh, and get our, get, then so we'd much. To, we'd have to get dressed up. Like right now, all I'm wearing is a cock sock and a hat. I, it was. It's weird. Yeah. It's <laughs> weird that that's all you're wearing. <laughs> and Tony's here in a bathrobe. You look like Howard Hughes. Don't, He's got Kleenex boxes on his face. Don't, don't tell lies about me. See, you can say it's a lie, <laughs> and they won't know because it's audio only, and we're not showing our big dumb faces. So people are going to be a bit upset, but we're going to stick to the YouTube format because. It's not like, we won't ever do another video on the YouTube channel. It's just this, the main podcast series is going to be audio only for a while. Right. I mean, a lot of you were kind enough to subscribe and comment. And it's a, I mean, it's a good platform for people to offer comments and feedback to know when a new episode goes up. We already have a pretty decent subscriber base here. People who were kind enough to support the podcast when we were doing videos. And we don't want to make you have to migrate to a new site that you might not be less familiar with, that you might that might make it more difficult to keep up when we put up episodes. And we might tr- we might do a thing where we give you a downloadable version of the podcast on some other site that you might be able to go get it. So if you just want to put it on your phone and listen to our stupid ideas. A lot of people told us, right, that uh, they listen to this while they're doing other things. So yeah, they, a lot of people talk about the videos anyway. A lot of people talk about how they just put it in the background, and that's sort of what we want to encourage more. Yeah. Put us in the background, uh, ignore us, don't really pay attention to what we're saying, uh, get the basic idea of what we're trying to say, and then misinterpret it and misquote it and totally misunderstand our message. Yes, and then come back in the comments and say something that is completely inane. Right, yeah. yeah. That's what we want. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's the ideal. So the video would really just be us sitting on a couch looking awkward. Yeah, and- slouched. Slouch, yeah. In a cock sock and a baseball cap. <laughs> That's right. The question is, who's wearing the baseball cap? And, who's... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we're just going to stick with this for now. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you guys like it. Um, <laughs> uh, and hopefully you guys are willing to stick with us through this sort of experiment uh, and that you enjoy it. And you really should because you, you asked for it. You did. You asked for me back, and... This is how you're getting Tony back. I give you about two weeks before you ask me to go away. Sounds, sounds reasonable. Yeah. I already want you to go away. Well, so maybe so, maybe a little bit better, maybe a little bit worse. And if anybody wants to complain, it's Tony's idea, so give him all the feedback. 100%. Yeah, 100% his all idea. All mine. Tony, what is your idea? What are we going to be doing? Well, the, uh, the idea is that uh, I, I feel like, and people may or may not agree, that we've kind of run... The course in terms of uh, talking about everything we can talk about on Ratchet and Clank. On Ratchet. Uh, looking back at all the episodes we did and all the all the commentary that we offered, 
the stuff that seemed to resonate the most is when we sort of pulled back the curtain and sort of revealed the kind of things that we focus on that people don't realize are so important to us. You mean the developer commentary worked best when we commented as developers? <laughs> uh, yeah, people seem to like it. Oh, whoa, that's crazy. Um, I mean, specifically, the episode that really seemed to catch the most fire. The crates? The crates. All, oh. the, all the time and effort that went into crate placement. And people didn't realize that it was actually a bit of a, an art. In the ass. Uh, well, that, yes, that too. But, uh, uh, well, the art slash pain in the ass uh, dichotomy is kind of what this new podcast would be about, right? There's just so much about what goes into making a game that I think is... Uh, not public knowledge. Not public knowledge. And people don't realize... Uh, so, w- the Gavin, who we used to work with... who, all, who uh, which, Gavin Dodd? Gavin Dodd, okay. who we used to work with at Insomniac. One of the first things he ta- taught me when I was trying to make games was that uh, the player will never notice subtlety. You should never try to do anything subtle in games because <laughs> it will never be noticed. But sometimes that's the point. That's the point. Yeah. There are so many things in games that are so subtle... That are meant to not be noticed. Right. And the fact that they're subtle means that they're fun and good. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so we want to focus more on the subtleties that you're meant to not see. Right. The stuff we hide from you so that you can have a better time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The things that you, that when they're not there, it's glaringly obvious that it's not there. But when they are there, you just sort of take them for granted. Right. It's kind of like electrical wiring in a wall, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. When it's not there, you don't have any power, right? Or something. Right, yeah. But when I it don't is know, there, don't you don't... When it is there, works. you don't see it. And your whole house works. That's right. Right? Right, yeah. yeah. Something like that. Just like that. Just like that. Exactly like that. Think about it like wiring, guys. Wiring. Given that, Tony, what do we want to talk about? What's our first subject for the... No, no, actually, even more importantly, what are we going to call this? Oh, you know what? That's a good question. I, mean, it's I still do not de- have a title. Still developer commentary. It maybe, is sort of developer commentary. Maybe the title will be per episode? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I, I we have the Useless Podcast label. Uh, this could just be our Useless Podcast. This is the Useless Podcast. I guess, put, I guess we're trying to make more of a podcast and less of an episodic series. Because that's what developer commentary was. It was an episodic series. Right, we go from one linear portion of the game to the next linear portion of the game and so forth. Uh, and like all episodic series, they have to come to an end eventually. And this one, it seems, is going to come to an end in the middle of Ratchet 1, unfortunately. Unfortunately. I mean, it's just sort of... Because Tony doesn't want to talk about <laughs> it anymore. Well, so uh, to give you a little bit of insight behind the scenes of my thinking, Mike... Um, we did. I I personally was only came on to Ratchet One when it was pretty much finished, so my experiences on Ratchet One are pretty pretty much limited to, uh, I played it when it was broken and I watched it slowly get less broken, and that's not exactly the most exciting thing to talk about. You don't know. You didn't talk about it. <laughs> um, I I toyed with the idea of playing some of the other Ratchet games and giving our opinion on that, but that seemed mean. Uh, on Twitter today, someone said. Game developers wouldn't be able to be objective about uh, about reviewing a game, right? Right. They wouldn't be that they would be too invested, I guess, in game development as a whole to understand what's wrong about it. I think it's the opposite. I th- I I agree that they wouldn't be objective, about, especially but, not about their own game. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, other people's games, they wouldn't be objective, but in the other way, I think they would be hypercritical of yes. everything everybody else's game did. Well, because every time a new game comes into the office and someone's playing it on the big TV, everybody gathers around and then they start just ripping the shit out of it. Right. Like, you have never seen, unless you've watched the Nature Channel and you've seen a zebra get torn up by a lion, you have never seen anything get savaged quite so much to say, when you're working on a first-person shooter. No, we can't. No, no, no specific games, Mike. That's a little bit too close. So should I bleep that out? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Let's say, let's say you're working on a game in that genre. When your competitor comes out, you have a vested Absolutely. interest in shitting all Absolutely. over it to make yourself feel better at that point. On, on, uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. Uh, I think it's well known that there is a friendly rivalry when we were making Ratchet & Clank amongst Insomniac, amongst Naughty Dog, 
and among Sucker Punch. Yeah, the we were, Sony first party. We were all trying to outdo each other. So you would play their games, and you wouldn't play their game with the idea of this is the greatest thing I've ever played. You're not gonna. You're not playing it for enjoyment. You're playing it to say, how can we do this better? That's what you when you when you're playing other people's games, you're gonna look for everything that they did wrong and how to improve on those things that they did wrong. Because here's something that you don't know. As soon as you become a game developer in any capacity, you lose the capacity to just enjoy a game. <laughs> like that is something that you will never have again. All you get to do at that after that point is study them to get better at making games. And while you can also enjoy a game while that's happening, you just don't get to do it the other way. Yeah, I mean every every feature, every every small detail in a game becomes a point of wanting to deconstruct it. Right. How did they do that so that I can do that or better? Right, exactly. Yeah. Why does this work? Why does this not work? Oh God, this is awesome. I need to remember <laughs> this so that I can use it. Right. I mean whenever whenever I played Street Fighter, oh. I love Street Fighter. Street Fighter is one of my favorite games. But they have this way that they have they have this thing that they do of selling the impact of their blows. Yeah. They freeze frames on, you know, just a you know, just exactly the right amount of time. They have the right particle effect. They don't even freeze the whole screen. It's just certain elements of the characters are frozen and sometimes they don't even freeze stuff. Sometimes they just move the camera in one direction. Right, exactly. Or, just the little camera shakes. Or flash to white or Right. There's so many little minute details that they do to sell the impact of every punch. <clears throat> right, those, exactly. Yeah. That I spent days trying to mimic their magical secret formula for making a hit really feel like a hit. Yeah. And it still wasn't coming out right. And so you just sit this there. This was when we were making a game for Capcom. So right, absolutely. They wanted us to deconstruct Street yeah, Fighter exactly. and figure out how to make a Capcom feeling game. Uh, so it's just sort of you see that stuff and you find something you really like, you get invested in figuring out why you really like it. Right. And when you find something you really don't like, you get invested in figuring out where it went wrong. Especially stuff that should have been good, but there's just a couple flaws here and there that don't quite work out. And you do that so that you can avoid making that mistake in the future. Right. Yeah. You know, we could probably do a whole episode of this on selling hit impacts. Yeah. And all the fucking work that goes into that because that takes months. I mean, I think I think a, a good way to continue this is to just sort of talk about a lot of those small details that we think go unnoticed. And I think that's a pretty good first episode. Yeah. And, you know, uh, also you can help us out by, in the comments, ask us questions to things that you kind of want to know more about. Absolutely. And they'll give us more that's ideas. That's going to be a lot more important for this particular series than it was for developing Ratchet, commentary. Yeah. Because we need it we're gonna need ideas for episodes. Well we had a finite amount of stuff we had a finite amount of time to talk about so much stuff in Ratchet. Yeah. That we didn't really need more coming in. I think we hit upon everything that was pretty uh, important just over the course of the thing. But for this, it's really the kind of stuff that people are curious about, about what happens behind the curtain that they didn't know about. Because we take so much of that for granted. Yeah. Because that's just our life. Now what everyone's going to ask, and what I think we need to answer now, is are we still going to play multiplayer Ratchet with them? I... maybe? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's not looking good right now. I don't even have a PlayStation 3 anymore. Oh, you got rid of yours. Yeah, it's, it's just... it vanished. I, st <laughs> I still have mine. So I have a PS4. Will that work? I don't think so. They're not backwards so. compatible. Okay, yeah, they're not, there's no PS3. Anymore. Maybe I will play with some people online. Yeah, I can give you the list. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, so the answer is we don't know. I probably won't because I lack hardware to play. It on. might not be a. It might not be a podcast episode. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen because I, I, I know a lot of people really wanted to keep doing ratchet stuff, but I, me personally, I feel like we've tread all ground that we can tread on there. Maybe there are some funny stories that we can tell and a couple other things, but they're so, like, I don't think we can fill up another 30 episodes with actual interesting, unique insights that we haven't already talked about. It, all, it feels like we'd just be retreading old ground. And maybe I'll finish Ratchet 1 with Teal, maybe, because uh, he plays it pretty quick. 
so we could get through it in another few episodes so that at least you guys don't feel like you're hanging anywhere. Right. But, uh, you know, it's just probably not. I know people are going to be mad at me for not wanting to finish it. But, I mean, just me personally, I don't feel like... Well, that means we probably won't be playing Deadlock, too. So Right. Which is probably for the well, best. Well, you weren't on Deadlocked. We'll, we'll be, I, I was on it for a while. Yeah, but I mean, it was... Yeah, yeah you, were on, you were on Resistance at that point. That's true. That's true. And we're not going to play Resistance, either. No, I wasn't on Resistance. You didn't work on it at all. I mean, not I... are not going to play World of Warcraft. We're not going to play any <laughs> of the Double Fine games. Not going to play any of the Double Fine. Double, Double Fine has been doing a, a really good job of doing... If you are interested in finding other sort of developer commentary type things, uh, Double Fine and two-player productions have started up their own developer commentary series spiders <laughs> i didn't say that <laughs> uh hey who had the idea we were doing it before it was cool i'm uh, just saying uh but that's something you might be worth checking out they've done like quake they've done psychonauts they've done a whole bunch of other things if you really are curious for that kind of content uh that's a good place to go maybe we'll do some small one-offs on other games but i don't think we're going to be doing these long 30 40 hour playthroughs right uh anymore I've got an idea for this episode then. I don't know if you're going to like it because it's topical. Okay. Molyneux. Okay. Peter Molyneux. That's, He's uh, been in the news a lot recently. He has? I'm sure people probably want to know uh, what what that's like to be in Molyneux's shoes. I feel like, personally, it's been very one-sided. Yeah. Because um, you're taking a big risk to stand up for for him right now uh you're i mean it's it's a contentious issue people feel very strongly uh to speak up sort of in in support of him is a dangerous proposition but i'm not a coward (laughs) so i think i'm gonna do it anyway okay well Uh, let's hear what let's hear you here's the here's the thing malanu is is he's doing the same thing that every game developer does Except he's talking about it during the period where we don't talk about it. Right. Right. When somebody gags you yeah. and says, don't you dare talk about this. Because if your name isn't Molyneux, they will force you not to talk about things during that phase. You just don't have the right to talk about them during the part where everything's still up in the air. Because when a game starts, it's totally blue sky. Like everybody thinks everything can be done. Right when we when we first started making a game for the PlayStation Three, Jesus, do you remember what they thought it was going to be capable of? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Promised us the moon. Yeah, promised us the moon, and we were getting just these incredible ideas and prototypes of the ideas. There's a guy that we used to work with at Insomniac, and I'm going to refrain from using his name because I don't know if this is praise or a slam. All right, fair enough. Um, Fair enough. Who was a genius at prototyping? Mm-hmm. Like you would put him in front of a computer for a couple days and let him go wild, and he would come back with the most insane, incredible ideas ever. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, think I remember I early in about. the early in the prototyping of Resistance, uh, he. I mean, I would just go by his desk every day. And he was like, "Oh, let me show you this thing I just came up with," and he would just be swinging around walls like Spider Man yeah. and all sorts of other stuff like here's, that. Here's a gun. Where everything in the level will come towards you and swirl around in a ball in front of you yeah. while you fire them out one at a time. Absolute genius in terms yeah. of coming up with ideas where you would look at them and you're like, oh my god, I've never seen something like that before. That's Like amazing. the Spider-Man webs, for sure. There was that Spider-Man web gun. Right. That, yeah. In early, early prototyping of Resistance, there was a Spider-Man web gun. And if we'd said, you'll be able to shoot guns and go anywhere you want and all that, we couldn't have pulled that off because the PlayStation 3 wasn't there. You, you, look, at the, you look at the prototypes and you say... This is amazing. We need to find a way to use this. But you don't commit to what you're to you're going to use this because it's yeah, a you prototype. Won't, you won't go out and tell the media, guys. Look look what we just prototyped. Spider-Man swinging. Come check it out. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like no, you you don't say I'm going to have a game with Spider-Man swinging in it until you know. Right. That's like, that's rule number 1. You would do the prototype in and then we would look at it and evaluate it and be like, "Okay, can we actually do this? Is there actually gameplay here? Is it fun?" Right. <laughs> that that's a minor question. Cuz there's so much stuff that's point. fun small scale that the minute you blow it up, you lose so much of that fun. Yeah, or it's only fun in say two situations ever. Right. And when you try to blow it up, you realize you don't have any more content to make for it because it's only two instances big. Right. 
And that's the kind of, that happens all the time. Like that's not. Sorry. It's okay. Just, I was disabling my phone because King of Thieves was telling me all my lock picks are back. Oh, excellent. So I'm going to have to go in and. Good job. And uh, raid some dungeons. Um, but yeah, this kind, that kind of thing happens all the time in every studio. Every studio over promises to themselves about what they're capable of. And to of. their publisher, for sure. Right. Yeah. And always falls up short. It's just sort of a matter of controlling how you scale back from your original vision. Yeah. And and with Kickstarter, it's the same exact thing that's happening between a publisher and a developer where the developer is promising the moon, right? And then finds out because they're they're trying to make the moon now that they can't. Right. Right? And then they have to go back to the publisher and say, well, the publisher in this case with Kickstarter is all of the people who gave the money. So now it can't be invisible from those people. Absolutely. So Molyneux has two weaknesses now. One, the weakness where he talks about the stuff. And two, the weakness where everybody is now his boss. <laughs> it's just not fair. Right. It's, And that's the thing about Kickstarter that's so scary, yeah. is that people are seeing a glimpse into what game development game development actually entails and it's horrifying it's absolutely horrifying to every game has a period where it's the you worst. have to take a really good hard look at yourself and say can we finish this game yes and the answer is always not the way it's set up right now yes yes like that always happens it just usually happens in be- usually in January for shipping a game in December. <laughs> That's like uh, they're like, oh shit, we've got six months. Can we make this game? No. Right, and then you start pulling back, and when you when people see that you're pulling back, they think something is incredibly wrong. When in reality, that's just the process. Yes, you 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 say the game is going to be this. And then you figure out what you can do, and then you scale back into reasonable bounds. Right. right. So if you planned more levels beyond, you know, three times as much as you could make in that period, you're fucked <laughs> if you try to make them. So you have to just scale back at that point. Right. You know, another thing we could talk about at some point is just the fact that uh, just because Blizzard can hold a game forever doesn't mean everybody can. Right. You know, uh, that's just not like the money runs out at some point uh, unless you're Blizzard. Yeah, I mean, it's just sort of, when you look at the actual process of game development and the number of roadblocks you have to clear, uh, the number of just people that have input and differing visions and pressure from the publisher side, pressure from the developer side, from pressure the from, from the consumers, pressure from marketing. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's an amazing, anything gets finished on time. Right. If it, The fact that one game a year gets made is a miracle. Right, exactly. And the fact that one good game gets made <laughs> every year, at least, right. is a miracle. I mean, miracles. if a game releases on schedule, that's a monumental feat. Regardless of the quality of the game. Yeah. The fact that it's on schedule and released is an incredible feat. That is really hard to pull off. Yeah, because, I mean, here's basically what you have to do if you're a game developer, right? Uh, you you have to say, all right, we want you to give us a ton of money. Like, we're not talking about chump change. We're talking about, like, $20 million, right? We want you to give us $20 million. Okay, well, we have $20 million. We're going to give it to you if you can prove to us that we should. And then you say, well... Of course you should, because we've got Spider-Man swinging, right? And then once you find out you can't do Spider-Man swinging, now you got to go back to the executives and say, "Oh, right, I can't do Spider-Man," <laughs> but I still need the twenty million dollars so that I can. So the fact that not every game gets canceled when Spider-Man swinging gets canceled right. is a miracle. Then there's the fact that once something that big falls out of your game, the the chances of your game finishing even they they decrease even more. Right. Right, because it's more likely things will get cut. It's more likely team members will leave. It's more likely that uh, you'll start making knee-jerk decisions that screw the entire thing up. Like, once one big thing goes wrong, everything goes wrong. And one big thing always goes wrong. Always goes wrong. So it's a miracle of miracles that a good game a year, at least, gets made. It's just a different perspective. Absolutely. I mean, and, and my opinion on Kickstarter is I think there was, when it... 
when it started catching on, there was and still remains a huge disconnect between how people think games are made and how games are made. And once people started seeing a glimpse of the process, they started thinking that, oh, they're obviously doing it all wrong because yeah. it, it seems so chaotic. <laughs> like, it can't possibly be this random and crazy. <laughs> exactly. And but, no, it is that random and crazy. Right. It's just it doesn't usually happen in front of you. Yeah. All we, the freakouts occur are, behind closed doors. There are people whose job it is to make sure that you never find out about that. Absolutely. The, I mean, I remember uh, in Ratchet 3, there was a point in time where I had about 2,000 bugs on my bug list. Yes, I remember. I remember that. People were a little worried about that. Yeah. And you have to look at the list and you're like, all right, at some point, these are going to have to be taken care of. And we're running out of time. And people freak out. How will this ever happen? It does not seem like there's enough time. The bug list just keeps getting longer and longer. Because the testers don't stop finding bugs. Exactly. exactly. Just because you have 2,000. Uh, and you have those little come to Jesus moments <laughs> where it's like, okay, is this, is this possible? Is this doable? And you find a way. To make it happen. Or you don't. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And the game gets quietly or not quietly canceled. Right. So this podcast is going to be about those sorts of things. Yes. The kinds of things that in general, or actually in specific, people hide from you. We're going to talk about them in general so that we don't get anybody in trouble. Right? Right. Absolutely. But, uh, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're obviously not going to be talking about anything that we're working on that's still under embargo or anything like that. It's just, in general, we're going to say, okay, look, this is what making a game has been like every single time we've done it for the last 13 years. And every person we've talked to. And every person we've talked to at every company they've ever worked with. And there's never been one counter <laughs> that I've ever heard of, right? We can we can share that with it you. It may seem like our, our scope of experience is limited, but... I'm comfortable in saying it's fairly representative. Yes, yes. So yeah, hopefully we can come up with some interesting topics. Uh, Please uh, help us. Hopefully we can show you what a disaster every game was that has ever been made. Yes, and how at... Uh, just to give you an idea of what it feels like to, to game develop, right? To jump out of a plane and be falling and realize that Wow, we're not very far from the ground, and we still haven't pulled our fucking shoot. And also, maybe to give you a shine a light on the kind of things that we think are important, as opposed to the kind of things that... Reviewers or gamers or anybody might think is important. Right, exactly. Here's a quick example. When uh, Mike and I were talking about uh, the new Shadow, Shadow of Mordor. Game, right, yeah, yeah. And I was trying to describe to him the Nemesis system without having played and I was describing about how it all worked and all this kind of stuff like that. Because I hadn't played it, but Tony had. And Mike's first question, first question about the Nemesis system was, how do you lay out that UI? Yes. <laughs> nothing about the mechanics, nothing about My, sort of... No, no. <laughs> how do you communicate all of that information to the, to player. the player? How do you make them understand? understand? Yeah. It wasn't anything about all the stuff that is, you know... It that, wasn't what, what kind of that stories grabs did you, you tell. Or, or, yeah, yeah, right. How fun is it? Just how is this not terribly confusing? Yes. How did they do this in such a way that it's playable and fun and not broken and awful? And Yeah, because I couldn't... When he described the feature to me, I could not think of how I would do it. I was like, I would veto this feature because it sounds, <laughs> it sounds like the worst thing. And now that I've played it, that would have been the wrong decision. Well, right? it's because it when you heard the feature... You said, there's all this information we have to convey to the player for them to understand what is going on. Yes. And if they do not understand what is going on, it's not worth the it's time. It's not happening if right. they don't understand what's going on. Uh, all of that complicated shit that's going on with the, the orcs, if you didn't know what was going on, you'd just be fighting some orcs and you'd be like, this kind of bull bullshit. Right, right? exactly. You, but the fact that you know every bit of information that that really sophisticated UI gives to you is a miracle. It, that... Pulls the feature together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's just combat. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, Assassin's Creed. Basically. And then you might as well just take it out. Yeah. Because and do something a lot easier. It. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, I was saying, I'm working on a thing right now that has procedural generation. 
And the problem I keep running into is if, if people don't fail a whole bunch of times, they won't know that it's getting procedurally generated right. because it's just happening in the background for all they know I laid it out that way. Right. right? So like how did they solve that problem with the UI? Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's funny because that probably wouldn't have been the first question anyone else would have asked you. No, they would have asked more about sort of the fights yeah. and that kind of stuff. Oh man, what happens when the guy does this or that? Or, right. Yeah. 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 Not me. Not me at all. <laughs> like, how do they level up and all that kind of stuff? And yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, that's the kind of thing. That's what we focus on a lot of the time when we talk about games. So these gems, like, how how did they do the UI? That's what you can expect from future episodes of The Useless Podcast, starring it's... me, Mike Stout. And me, Tony Garcia. And we'll catch you next time, won't we, Tony? We can hope so. I think it went pretty well. I think so. Yeah, that's an I think that can be edited together something that's really good.